Hello, welcome to this special CUBE presentation here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, with a special VMware Cloud Foundation Transformed presentation. We have a series of guests come in. We're going to unpack where VCF is going, where Broadcom is taking the next level AI, generative AI position. I'm going to bring that to you. Chris Wolf is here, who's the Global Head of AI and Advanced Services. Good to see you. Likewise, John, good to see you. So Global Head of AI and Advanced Services, that's a big title. You got, so that means you're going to unpack the entire Broadcom VMware program out to the customers. So last year, this time, you, you launched Private AI here on theCUBE. We did. You guys were the first, and at that time, it was clear to us in our power law that we, we started seeing the smaller models and especially models kicking in. That played out this year. Congratulations to you guys for building the category. Private AI is the hottest topic. The, uh, the hardware manufacturers like Dell, HPE, they're building systems for this. It's a big part of the industry, so congratulations. How does it feel? It, it feels great. I mean, it, it, it really comes down to listening to your customers and understanding where their needs are, and then also being smart about finding what your market fit is, so that all those things came together. It was a probably a year effort for us to get to the concept of private AI and fully have it vetted and baked, but here we are, we're seeing the market re react really strongly. I remember, I remember the early conversation, you guys were very clear on this, had the vision, so great, you saw the North Star, but you saw the reality of where the market was. The consumer side was booming, the proprietary models, multimodal, foundation models, now called pi pioneer models, I guess, but the enterprises weren't leaning into it. You guys knew that, you saw it, and since then you've made a lot of investments. Can you take us through what happened, what you invested, and what was the bet, and where are we right now? Yeah, so what we were betting on was that privacy and control of data really mattered to customers. The ability to bring the AI model to wherever their data resided would matter to customers. And even last summer, we had some real insights in terms of operating AI services in an enterprise data center, because we were doing that ourselves. And we were seeing that our, some of our internal services were roughly the th one third the cost of comparable public cloud services. So we knew we were onto something that it wasn't just about getting these benefits, but you were getting a lower cost as well. So that was kind of like what really grounded our strategy. We partnered with NVIDIA. We announced Private AI Foundation with NVIDIA at Explore last year. And now, and uh, just last month, we went generally available. We're seeing significant customer traction really getting behind what we're doing. You get the best of NVIDIA, the best of VMware and Broadcom uh, technologies together right in a, in a unified platform. You know, I saw in the news recently, the uh, founder uh, who left OpenAI starts new, starting a new company and they're going to focus on super intelligence. Uh, at our super cloud event, when you were here, you were kind of seeing that direction where LLMs and large language models and foundation models in the enterprise were different. Um, what happened in your mind that kind of tipped the scales that said, okay, this is happening, we're going to double down on this? Yeah, we saw the trend for sure. And we saw that we had a very, a uh, specific space that would really fill in a, a key gap. And we also saw what our approach was going to be very complementary because at the time, most of the ecosystem players, they were going full stack, like bet on our software stack all the way down through our hardware, make a bet with us. And we're, we were thinking, no way. You know, the space is moving so fast that you can't just bet on a single platform or a single solution. So we said, we need to take a platform approach. Bet on an AI infrastructure platform that's going to give you some optionality so that as something changes, right, you can quickly adopt it. And to give you an example, one of our top internal AI services, we've changed the foundation model three times in the last nine months, just because we keep getting better results. And the platform approach is what gives you that agility, and that's, that's a key reason why folks are betting on us. You know, it's interesting, um, the big conversation at a lot of the conferences in here is that this, uh, the Gen AI is changing the stack of, for integrating that stack for customers. There's obviously compute and horsepower and, and all that jazz. But you got the data stack, and then you also got this new model stack emerging. So that's, I mean, generically speaking. The models are now kind of decoupled from compute and data as they start to bring in neural networks, you start seeing different infrastructure targeted for those workloads that will be running on neural networks. What's your take on that and how does that, how did that inter interface with private AI and your, your efforts? Yeah, yeah, sure. So we, we've taken a, a, a pretty broad ecosystem approach. Like one thing that really works for us is that we're not opinionated in those higher level models or AI services. So it's, a, it's really allowed the AI community to want to partner with us because we're not a direct competitor. Whether you're an AI ISV, you're producing models, et cetera, we want to be the runtime. And that's where we've been really successful. So if we, you know, if we step back and, and kind of tease that out, yeah. you get the NVIDIA inference microservices, you have all of the automation that sits below that, and that's been one of the struggles for AI. It's easy to say run an AI app. Well, how do you automate the deployment? How do you automate 
beyond day two, right? How do you secure it? How do you add governance and controls? These are the real challenges that folks face. And then the other issue is, I, I can't just go out and buy all this AI infrastructure, right? I have to figure out how do I effectively use it? That's been another key area that's driven our early adopters is, uh, if I just use pure physical capacity, oftentimes, I might claim a GPU, but I only need a fraction of the GPU. Yeah. So being able to virtualize and share like GPUs, which are hard to come by, right, is really important. Well, I think the workloads have to all include GPU management, because now the infrastructure that you guys have been doing for many, many years has been an IT kind of backbone and kind of fabric, but IT's changing. We hear Jensen Wong say this in almost all his keynotes, is that if you're in IT today, you got to lean into generative AI because it's sure. a net new category. Yep. So the category is new, so it's generative, so it's going to change the face of IT. So they got to lean into automation, rethink those stacks. So given all that, which I'm sure you agree because we're on the same page on that one, but private AI is key to that. What's the status of the private AI right now for you guys? Is it shipping, is G8, you're announcing GA, and what's the relationship with NVIDIA? Yeah, so we've uh, launched uh, our GA product last month. Uh, we've seen tremendous customer traction. This is, in terms of a new product launch, this is the most exciting product launch in terms of just pure traction I've ever seen in my career. So that's been, that's been really exciting for us, just to see the customer demand and now what we're seeing is a couple different classes of customers. So the early adopters of AI that have been running services in the public cloud, they're coming to us for a few different reasons. They might have had an on-prem solution that's been on bare metal, and you have a lot of challenges in terms of how do I manage resource scheduling? Right? How do I manage availability? Uh, how do I intelligently connect uh, an application to the right amount of infrastructure capacity? How do I reclaim capacity? These are really difficult problems to solve, and VMware's had technologies such as DRS, our distributed resource mm -hmm. scheduler, for decades, right? Yeah. So being able to expand on the core technology and the foundation we have has allowed us to add all of this value to AI infrastructure. That's attracted customers. The other thing that's really brought them in is cost. So we're seeing customers tell us, like, to run the AI service on-prem could be sometimes three to five X less expensive than running that comparable service in a public cloud. And it's not for everything. Like, I'll, I'll use the cloud services for uh, training models where I need that bursty capacity. When I want to do inference workloads and just apply the AI model to an application, the cost savings is significant. So we have one class of customers, which is that uh, early AI adopter. They've had experience running Gen AI for maybe two years now. And they're like, cost is my biggest issue. Mm -hmm. Help me with that. Huge. Or they're running, or they have their own on-prem stack and they have the same issues. Like they, they can't, they struggle with resource management, all these things, and we can give them all of that. So there's tremendous value there. And then you also have this other class, which is the, they want to get their AI win. Every organization has a uh, document summation, document type search use case. Get my support techs uh, faster access to the meaningful data they need to be able to close tickets quicker. Right? Everybody has that use case. There's even a college we're working with and their use case is, our campus is huge, and when our students schedule classes, it's very difficult for them to figure out, well, this class is available, but can I actually get to it on time? All right, so it's a, it's a <laughs> cool language model use case, right, to, to do these types of things as well. So we have that gambit from financial services uh, to public sector organizations where they have proprietary data sources, their own proprietary, that a contractor built for them decades ago. Yeah. Right, so bringing the model to the data is just a huge value to them. And then the other side too is on the partner side, ISVs love us because we're, we're non-competitive, right? Yeah. We, we, can, we can easily approach a customer together uh, and, and help to solve problems. So all of that is driving the momentum. So we have lots of customers, yeah. uh, use cases around document summation, uh, code development, uh, contact centers are the types of things we're seeing. But again, it's the value of the privacy and control and the, the total cost of ownership being lower than other yeah. services, that's been really attractive. You know, you talk about the customers, and we'll get to the ecosystem in a second, and that's a big part of this. But on private AI, you mentioned a bunch of things there. There's different kind of orientations to how people are leaning in. Um, but the number one thing that we hear is costs. How do I scope the costs? What am I dealing with? Because there's so much data in every use yeah. case. I mean, whether you're a large campus or a school or hospital or healthcare, there's data everywhere, and that's the key thread here with private AI that we're seeing. What's your reaction to that? And Because data seems to be the, the main criteria, and privacy and security, obviously, that's key for all enterprises, but yeah. 
their data now is their crown jewel. So private AI is aligning with the data and also their challenges with say security and privacy. How are you guys addressing that with private AI? How's your architecture meet them where they are on scoping, understanding scale, and then what the use cases are going to be developing? Yeah, it's really, it's really key. So first, I don't have to take data out of one of my own internal data sources that I control and then move it to somebody else's perhaps proprietary data source to gain a benefit. And there's also just genuine concerns organizations have, like is this data now going to be, uh, help it to influence a model that might uh, benefit my competitors? You know, there's other challenges such as, am I, if I'm even just passing code to an external service, my, my customers that I sell to might have challenges even trusting my code at that point. Right, these are just genuine like tactical issues that organizations face are faced with. So mm -hmm. they even want stacks even for code development where they have full control, they have full isolation of those as well. And, they, and these are things that they can prove to an auditor. But bringing the model adjacent to the data sources pr creates a lot of agility and flexibility for the organizations. And then they can quickly stand up using retrieval log managed generation architectures. It's very easy to collect the data that you need to feed to a foundation model and get good results. And we're even seeing now, the, the models are getting so good, like one of the ones we use is Mixtral 8x7b internally, yeah. and we're finding with very little fine tuning, you're getting accuracies with RAG in like the 70s. I yeah. mean, and that's, that's incredible. And what it means is you don't have to have this massive team of data scientists to get these benefits of AI. It's, it's becoming more and more consumable for the enterprise, even if they don't have that experience. Yeah, it's interesting, we just did that segment uh, on theCUBE last week around how the neural network infrastructure of vectors and tokens have changed, retrieval, all kinds of how data is being used. And the enterprise AI story was pretty much like a year ago, well, the enterprise doesn't, you know, people kind of body swerving that. Now with private AI, people see immediate benefit, low hanging fruit, retrieval augmentation generation or RAG, you got new ways to bring in say PDFs or, or, or images. I mean, it's off the chart, Every, there's use cases everywhere. So the point is, there's no shortage of where to attack and test. And so everyone's leaning into that and they're getting into it for that reason. The question then comes in, and every company we talk to asks the same question. What does AI mean to me? No matter what the entry point is. Development, how do I do development better? How do I make my networks run better? How do I run my workload? So the question I want to ask you is, how does private AI impact your customers at that Broadcom and VMware because their infrastructure, they're managing workloads, but also have a developer front end. So is it everything or where do you, where do you lock in? What's the, the lock in position? Yeah, yeah, for us, I, I wouldn't use the term lock in. Uh, well, I don't mean lock in like the building. Because like, where do you we use, uh, you know, like we can expose our infrastructure through a Kubernetes API or through a Ray API and lots of other yeah. open source constraints. And that's important <laughs> because we, we want to be, we want our customers to, run on our stack yeah. because we're the best platform for them, yeah. not because we're doing anything unnatural. But we have so much experience, right, driving platform services. Like VMware has always been the platform you can trust to run a whole variety of applications. And we're expanding that to mm -hmm. artificial intelligence applications and doing really slick things in terms of how you schedule and manage access to GPUs and how you automate all of that. So that's been really essential for, our, for the customers that have been onboarding with us is that they can get yeah. very quick time to value. And um, you know, so, so I think those are some of the areas that have uh, influenced at least the, the customer decision to, to partner with us. But again, it's, it's control of the data, it's privacy, yeah. and it's- There's innovation everywhere in the workload, workload management, enabling developers, you mentioned Kubernetes, I said lock-in by the way, I didn't mean lock-in like it's a lock-in spec. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. Like where the, where the focus is, where's the, where's the beach, core yeah. beachhead for Broadcom VMware with the, your customers? Yeah. Because there's extensibility with private AI, and that's basically what you're getting at. Yeah, 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 so it's the extensibility, it's, it's the flexibility to run all of these different services to very quickly pivot is one, but then uh, you know, on top of that, it's, um, it's, it's inference. Because if you look at some of the stats out there, like yeah. the focus on AI often is on the training workloads. Yeah. And that's like 4% of like the actual compute cycles being driven to AI. The rest is runtime and it's inference. And that's where we're seeing customers. Like I was talking to one of the largest global banks yesterday. Yeah. They, have a, they have a separate DGX cluster they're using for training, fine. Yeah. But their inference decision is to run inference on their VMware platform because we're going to give them the best economics, the best total cost of ownership, the best reliability. And, and, and the, the way that we can help them to manage and maximize their GPU infrastructure is something they just can't do with anybody else. Yeah, and I think that's key, because that's the scale needed. The other piece that comes up I want to get your thoughts on is, is that you mentioned runtime earlier. Generative AI is generative. It's 
not the old school way of like pre-programmed. This is what NVIDIA is leaning into with their narrative saying, and he's, he's not wrong, I mean, it's a new category. It changes IT because the data changes, right? So that's one. How do you see that playing out from private AI? Is that the a avenue you're getting the most traction in? Is the fact that people are saying, hey, I could have uh, inference and reinforced learning and at runtime, is that a piece of that? How, do we, how would you react to that? Yeah, I can have it, I can have it adjacent to my data. I, I can get quicker time to value because I don't have to plan any types of data migration projects. That's really key. Um, so so you're, you're definitely on the right track there in terms of where the value is with, with private AI. It's that model adjacency to the data. And again, customer. it's not just about what you can even do from a pure technology sense, right? It's what is your legal teams comfortable with? What can you, what is acceptable from a regulatory compliance perspective? You know, all of these things really matter and, and drive that decision. And then you start to look at just even doing things like segmenting models mm. based on access groups or segmenting your data indexes based on access groups, which is a very effective way to implement the right uh, levels of uh, privacy controls as well. Chris, I want to get your thoughts. You've, you've, you've been in many industry cycles. You've seen a lot. This is a big one. And you, you just talked about the customer impact, which by the way is awesome. The ecosystem's changing too. You're seeing the platform shift happen, but also the yeah. ecosystem shifts with it. How is the ecosystem changing? How are you guys rolling with that? Can you point out some uh, successes and some changes or what's changed in the ecosystem uh, for the better? What's, what's the key ecosystem impact is? Because there's more APIs everywhere connecting people. The, the new data models are out there. You got model stacks. What's the ecosystem impact? Yeah, I how think you guys in the, in the middle of it? It's been exciting. I think there's there's a couple flavors of it. You know, you, you hit on one earlier, which is domain specific models, and getting down to models like like VMware. We're a software development company, mm -hmm. right? I don't need an AI model that is an expert in healthcare, right? I, I don't need that information. That just adds to model bloat. So I can get to focus models on what I need, and and be very successful with that. So you're seeing that traction starting to really influence some of these applications. That's one. Uh, we're seeing, uh, in our case, we have a very clear demarcation point between the value we're providing, like we're stopping at those AI infrastructure services. So if you're, if you're an ISV doing app development, you're, you're doing uh, uh, AI models or open source or whatever, we're the company to partner with because we can approach the customer together where we have joint value. Same thing with our SI partners. We're seeing system integrators really glom onto us because there's a very clear place where they're adding value and can support the customer through their entire application lifecycle. Okay. So that's driving a lot of this ecosystem around what we're doing. And to me, that's exciting. Yeah. We, we, we're really a great enabler for these ISVs coming up because it, in some cases, it can be more difficult for them to work with a cloud provider because the cloud provider has their own AI stack that they're also trying to sell. We're, we're really pushing work with us because again, we're neutral, we can work together and solve customer problems together. And so I, you're attracting ISVs because they, they can get access to the data and hence with Gen AI, the new development environment will be leveraging that. Is that, yep. is that you said true? Yeah, yeah, right, for what sure. What trends are you tracking right now as you look forward? You got VMware Explorer, I'm sure you don't want to reveal all the surprises that you got planned. Um, uh, I'm sure you got a few surprises. Can you give us a little teaser on that? And also, what are you tracking right now that's going to be ex extending, accelerating the uh, generative AI and private AI foundation? Yeah, I think the, the maturity of services is really important. So there's a lot of velocity in open source communities around data collection, as an example. So the hard part with retrieval augmented generation had been actually indexing and collecting data to be able to feed to a model. And Years ago, when we first started down this path internally, we had to build our own data collectors because they just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And today there's, there's great projects out there, whether it's like Langchain, Llama Index, there's others that can really help to make that far more turnkey for organizations. So that, that uh, velocity there to help with the attainment of AI, I think is, is important. Uh, the other areas are really for us, it's, it gets into our core. It's providing um, AI model governance, it's providing really deep insights into how to intelligently place uh, an AI application on the right infrastructure the first time and taking the guesswork out, mm -hmm. right? This, this is the kind of stuff in terms of really advanced workload management. We've been great at this stuff, right? So yeah. this is what's really going to help. So it's driving those efficiencies, lowering the cost. And the other thing we haven't even mentioned that's important here is carbon footprint. Like people get concerned about like the power footprints to their racks for AI. And, and when you start to get into these more smaller domain specific models, guess what? You can start to run AI applications without having to completely you know, change that power dynamic of your data centers. 
uh, which can also make a huge difference. Again, it's going to depend on the application. Like there's some that need, some applications are going to need dozens of GPUs. Don't get me wrong, but there's others that yeah. you might get away with four or eight GPUs, and it's going to be fine for the use case. It's interesting watching VM over the years. You've been basically running IT for operations and companies. Operations are changing radically too. Uh, as head of AI, you're looking at that that 20 mile stair down the road. What's your priorities now? You want to, you're going to building these new advanced services. What's the pri what are your priorities? Yeah, if I say what is the North Star, we, we want people to rethink about VMware now, where VMware Cloud Foundation is your platform for all applications, period. You're going to have the best control, you're going to have the best privacy, you're going to have the most flexibility running modern applications on our stack. So you're seeing a lot of investment in, and Paul will talk to, the, to you about this as well, in what we're doing around Kubernetes, making that simple, mm -hmm. what we're doing with AI and making that super consumable. And then you're seeing even with technologies such as our data services manager, giving you database as a service, just native to the platform. So to run an entire modern app stack with yeah. more flexibility and choice is what you're going to see from us going forward. And then even much more so on the AI side. So just really slick things. So if you're not signed <laughs> up for Explore, you better get there yeah. because we're going to show some really cool stuff in the next couple of months. I'd love to talk more about it here. But we have uh, PR sitting next to me, and I, I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> exactly, and, and one of the beautiful things, when we talked about this off camera before, uh, a lot of people like to compare this, this shift to like the internet, and we're consumer-led, then enterprise followed right after. And we said, and, and we discussed it, and it's happening, and I want to get your thoughts, the, ex, the enterprise is happening. It's happening faster. We're in an accelerated cycle where consumer and enterprise are almost neck and neck in terms of adoption. A year ago, people were saying, well, AI is chatbots, it's customer support. Okay, it's so much more than that. Share your thoughts on, on what's happened that made that, why is it accelerating so fast? Is it more data? Is it more mature infrastructure? Is it the fact that people are, are, are at large scale? What's the, why is, excel, why is the enterprise excel, AI accelerating faster than most people thought? Yeah, I, I think it's because of the uh, efficiencies that you can gain from AI, that it, it's making people more productive. It's, it's letting them find the needle in the haystack faster, finding the information they need faster, at least in a lot of these generative AI use cases. And I think what's important about like the VMware approach is we're very deliberate in mm -hmm. making sure that the human is in the information loop. So like all of our AI services, we call it intelligent assist. So AI is there to assist the human. And when the humans start to look at this as a tool that's going to help them to be more productive in their job and help them to find things faster, right? Create content or whatever, that's where it really makes a difference. I mean, and we have uh, like one of, one of the data scientists and, and, and he's an AI engineer on my team. He uh, uh, just had this experience with this code assistant technology that we've been running internally. Yeah. And, and he was able to write an entire app in like a couple of weeks. And he said that would have taken him probably yeah. six months without the code assist technologies. VMware Cloud Foundation obviously has transformed. We're in a new era of innovation. Uh, what's the one thing that you've learned over the past year that you can share to folks watching, customers or potential customers that are going to implement private AI? Uh, what's the best practice? What's the best approach? How should they lean into private AI? Yeah, I think that the best approach is to really narrow your focus and narrow your scope. Like you have to get very specific. Everybody wants to have a, an AI win. So to me, it's, it starts with focusing on the sure bets, which is why we have private AI foundation with NVIDIA, right? If you go with trusted partners in this, in your journey, mm -hmm. you're going to get good results. And, you, and for a lot of companies, this is a board level yeah. imperative, right? They want it, the board wants to see the CEO show an AI win. And so starting with us, starting with a trusted platform is one. Taking a platform approach is really important because you don't want to just bet on that one app stack yeah. because it's, you're, going to, you're going to have buyer's remorse next month <laughs> if you do that, right? Yeah. So, so that's the other area is to, is to take the platform approach from us. That's worked out. And then what we're focused on with customers is getting them that quick win. So oftentimes, like what is the data issue that you're having, right? What, what does it take people the longest to gain information yeah. to? And this is banks, this is public yeah. sector organizations, right? It, it runs the gambit in terms of, uh, you know, healthcare, et cetera, in terms of how can I help? So you have to narrow your scope, think about yeah. one problem, get that AI win, and then, then understand how you're operating that AI application then start to move on to other things, right? So w that's been our focus this year, is getting customers to that first AI win yeah. that they can iterate on and then start to look at additional And by the way, that's an easy year. win because they have data and the data gets them the ability to do it on a private environment. They get the win, they can understand how to operationalize it, scale it, and then everything kind of falls into place. Yeah, they can go from zero to a running AI application in two weeks. 
If you have the right scope, yeah. you, can, you can get there very quickly and see immediate value. And the beautiful thing for you guys, and again, props for being right on the right, right wave here early, is that all the hardware and all the systems being rolled out now are right into what you're doing. 100%. All your customers are building faster, smaller, clustered systems, large scale, NVIDIA mentioned, one of the yep. leaders, others, all your OEM partners. So the ecosystem is changing. <laughs> it, it is, it is, it's, it's well, moving good, good. quick. Yeah, I think that's the difference. Like AI has really reset the velocity expectation. Well, the value creation is going to be amazing. The app tsunami coming, it's going to be a Cambrian explosion in applications, but they got to get their ops lined up, infrastructure teed up. That's it, start with it, get your house in order. Get a reliable IaaS first underneath your AI services and then you can grow from there. Chris Wolf, you heard it here, head of AI for Broadcom here on theCUBE, breaking down the, in the private AI wave that's here. It's certainly tracking, it's all lining up perfectly to fund and fuel the next generation of value. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE, thanks for watching.